dispelling the myths, and embracing the truth. Today, His Eminence Bishop Omega preaches a sermon titled, Satan Can't Make You Do Anything, subtitled, The Flesh Versus the Spirit of God. Be enlightened and encouraged. Peace be unto you, saints, and praise the Lord. Now, the reason we're here today, let us get to the Word. And by the way, I thank you all so very much for all your kind words, and I am really inspired by how much the Word means to so many of you. And I know many of you look forward to this time in your week to share the Word of God, to be edified, that is to say, uplifted, and to be educated in the Word of God. And to that end, I'd like to bring a message today, by the grace of God, that I hope will dispel a lot of myths that we have come, we have, as people, have come to believe concerning the devil or concerning Satan. Today we're going to make it very clear, Lord willing, about what or who it is that does or does not make you sin. You know, back in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a very popular show, uh, Flip Wilson show called, uh, the Flip Wilson show, and on it he used to often say, the devil made me do it. And a lot of people today believe that the devil makes you do things. And I want to use Bible. I want you to pay attention today, listen, saints. I want to use Bible today to make it abundantly clear that Satan can make you do nothing. The devil doesn't make you do anything. Now, we're not just going to say that and leave it there. We're going to give you scripture. So, as I often like to do sometimes before we get started, I want you to ask yourself, do I believe what's in scripture? This is very serious to me. The Word of God is the most important thing there is. So we take painstaking efforts to get it right. But we also have to dispel myths that people tend to pass down from generation to generation. We've often heard our uh, seniors, our elders, and some, we, maybe we've said it ourselves, say, Lord, that devil made me do so and so and so and so. I am here today to dispel that, that the Bible makes it abundantly clear that the devil, that Satan, can make you do nothing. And especially children of God, Satan makes you do nothing. Now we're going to give scripture, but before we get to the, the closing part where I give you 10 or 11 scriptures, I forget, telling you what Satan can't do, let me use scripture to tell you, or to emphasize and show why we do sin. First of all, James makes it very clear in James 1, 4, that if I can get it quickly, that you are led astray by your own desires. So if we can just start there, we know that Satan is there to tempt. He's there to lure. But James makes it very clear in uh, James 1.14. Let me just read this I've, as I've dealt with it before, but I'll start with 13. Let no one say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God. Clearly, it's not God who's luring you to sin, but God will allow tests in your lives. We've been over that. But listen to this. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone to do evil, is what it's saying. But now listen to this. But each one, that's you, that's me, that's everyone, every human being, each one uh, is tempted when he is drawn away by the influence of Satan. It doesn't say that, does it? It says by his own desires, by your own desires, and enticed. I'm, I started off with that one, James 1.14 just so we can see that you are the one that's responsible for your sinning. Now, does Satan tempt you? Yes. Does the Lord allow him to tempt you? Absolutely yes. And we're going to address these kinds of things today so we can stop, believe it or not, I'm not an advocate for the devil, but I'm just saying, stop putting more on Satan than the Bible does. Satan does something. He accuses us around the clock before God. Day and night, he's the accuser. That's why I said in the message last week, we shouldn't slander each other, slander or accuse each other, bad name one another, because Satan is the father of that. He does it around the clock. Thank God we have Jesus sitting there at the right hand of God, the Father saying, no, no, don't believe him. This one is mine. I have her. I have him. Now, not that God the Father didn't know that. It's just the way God has set up his court where he allows Satan to accuse us to him, but he has himself there, Jesus, 
to be our lawyer, our advocate, our spokesperson for us, saying, no, no, not this one, Lord. Don't, Father, don't believe the devil. But anyway, that's another subject. What we're getting at today is the devil doesn't make you do anything. We just read in James 1.14, please write this down so you can see you're drawn away when you, by your own desires. So it is the flesh. When you hear me today using the word flesh, fleshly or fleshy, same thing. And all that means is anything human that is not under the influence of the Spirit of God. That's all fleshy means. When we are drawn away by the flesh, when you're enticed by your members, that's just referring to the human being that is not walking in the Spirit, under the power of the Spirit, adhering to God and His influence. That's all flesh means. It doesn't just mean the human, the human material here or this fleshy tissue. It means your thoughts. It means your motivations. It means your desires. That's all considered fleshy. So the Scripture tells us, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Here is how you do not sin. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Again, flesh simply refers, it's not that deep to understand. S flesh simply ref refers to any time you're not being guided by the Spirit of God, but you're being guided by humanness, your humanity. So it says, walk, be, now walk also implies progress. When it's, that's why the word walk is used. Not just live in the Spirit, but you keep progressing. Every day you live more and more in the Spirit. So walk, I love that verb that Paul uses uh, in Galatians here. I'm in Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust, the desires, the wants, the motivations of the flesh. Listen to this reason why you should do that. Because the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The two are in conflict with each other. God and his ways are in total conflict to what the fleshy man, the earthy man, the unregenerate man wants. You may say, but I thought you said we're regenerate if we're in the spirit of, if we're saved. Yes, but every saved person doesn't always walk by the spirit. And someone will say, you, you preach it, do you? No, I do not. Let's just be honest. You want me to, I will not sit here and lie and say I always walk in the power of the spirit. But I am to tell you to do that because we are all, we all are to do it. Didn't Paul even say in Romans 5, listen to this, saints, Romans 5, uh, 15. He says, for that which I do not, uh, which I do, I allow not. For what I would or what I want to do, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. If then... I do that which I would not, which I don't want to do. I consent unto the law that it is good, the word of God, that it is good, because it convicts me. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Let me read on. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in my naturalness, without the spirit of God's influence, that is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present, I want to do right. For to will is present with me. That's that spirit of God in me, wants to do right. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. Meaning, I can't always make this body submit, this whole self submit to the Spirit of God and do what is right. For the good that I would do, the good that I want to do, uh, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. He's saying very simply that we don't always submit. This is Paul talking in uh, Romans uh, 5.15. I'm now at 5.19. Uh, For the good that I would want to do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do uh, that which I would not, which I don't want to do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul is acknowledging in every human being, even in someone saved like Paul, even in someone saved like you, like me, there's still the sin nature in us. And when we don't submit to the Spirit of God, walk in the Spirit, we end up fulfilling what the flesh wants to do, what the human wants to do. Listen to this. Now, you didn't hear him mention Satan yet, by the way, did you? All right, that's my point I'm making. Listen to this. I find then a law, a principle, that when I would do good, when I want to do good, evil is present. I find this to be a principle. Whenever I want to do good, there's always some evil there tempting me. For I delight in the law of God, 
after the inward man. What's in me, that spirit of God, I love what's right. I love to fulfill God's word. I want to do what's right. I delight in that. He says, but I see another principle, another law in my members. He doesn't just mean your fingers. He means in my whole being, in my motivations, in my mind, in my body, in the desires I have. He said, but I find in my, I find, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Did he mention Satan yet? Why am I reading this exhaustively? Because he's making the point it's in us. That sin nature is in us and we have to learn to live by the power of God and not follow our own sin nature. Listen how he concludes. You've been here with me before. He, he comes to the conclusion, oh, wretched man that I am. He knows as a human being, I'm a wretch. That's why people who object to that um, song, uh, Amazing Grace, he says, uh, what a wretch I am, or some words to that effect I used recently. The Bible says here, we're wretched. The human being is wretched without the power and the saving of Spirit of God. It says, oh, wretched man that I am. In other words, it's hopeless. Who shall deliver me from this body of, from the body of this death? Here who, here's who shall. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. What he is saying, and let me just sum it up in plain English. I want to do right. The spirit of God that's in me, I know what's right and I know what's wrong. And every time I mess up, don't blame God. It's that nature of the human being in us that didn't submit to God and let God win. So whenever we saved individual sin, would you please stop saying Satan made me do it? Paul just made it very clear in Romans 5, 15 through whatever I just read. What was it, 25? 15 through, some, through 25. He made it very clear the problem is in the nature of the fallen man. Now, we're going to see that it is Satan that tempts, but Satan can't make you do anything. It is only when we don't put these, this mem these members, and the, not just your feet, your hands, and your other organs, no, 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 your whole being, when you don't put it under subjection to God, that's when we sin. And I'm going to give you scriptures later, but let me just get, make this point before we get to the meat of the, of the message. He says, so, let's go back to Galatians 5, 16. Here's what I, Paul says, here's what I say, walk progressively stay in the, under the influence, walk, implying motion, progression. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of, lust of the flesh. For the flesh fights or lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary to one another so that you uh, do not do the things that you wish to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, listen to this very clearly. This is what the flesh does. He doesn't say this is what Satan makes you do. Pay attention, saints. I'm at now Galatians 5, 19. I want you to, you can read. This is what the flesh does. He didn't say this is what Satan makes you do. He says, now, the works of the flesh are evident, are these, which are what? Adultery, fornication, and notice he deals with primarily three categories, that of sex, religion, and human relationships. Listen to this, and you can figure out and listen when, which one is dealing with sex, which one is dealing with human relationship, which one is dealing with religion. He says, this is what your flesh makes you do, your humanness, your lack of being under the influence of God and his spirit. When you don't yield your members to God, when you don't yield all of your being to God, when you don't put on that whole armor and fight those fiery, resist those fiery darts of the devil, who's only tempting you. The devil doesn't make you do anything. He's not God. He's not that powerful. As God, I'm saying. He is very powerful. He's not as powerful as God. But you, I'll get to other scriptures in a minute to show you what I'm talking about. Now, says Paul in 19, verse 19, Galatians, the fifth chapter, this is what the unregenerate man does. These are the works this shows that you're not under the influence of the power of the Spirit. And here he means people who do this as a lifestyle, people who do this with impunity. He is not saying no saved person will ever do one or some of these things he's about to list. But when someone 
lives in this, walks in this, and this is their lifestyle, and they do it with impunity, he's saying this is the, these are the works of the flesh. And notice he said of the flesh. He did not say these are the works of the devil. The devil lures you and tempts you, but you give him permission to use you when you submit to him, just like you give God permission to use you when you submit to him. I want to make this very clear today. The devil can't make you do anything. He only puts the the temptations there before you to lure you away from a godly life. But I want you to please read so don't just say, well, that's what Bishop said. This is what the Bible, this is what the Word of God says. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness in general, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousies, wrath or outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rev- revelries. Now, when he says drunkenness and revelries, that implies orgies because it implies being so drunk that you end up in debauchery in a sexual sense. That's why those two are placed together. I said all of these are going to involve sex, religion, and human relationships. And look at these. This is what the natural man yearns. This is what the fleshy part of humanity does. That's what this is saying. Heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, uh, uh, revelries, and the like. Which means Paul just said, I didn't name every specific thing. He says, and things like that. These are all uh, acts or the product of being fleshy. He says, of which I tell you uh, uh, beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things practice. There again. Those who have a lifestyle of these things, those who do these things with impunity, those who say it's just the way I am, he's saying, who who practice these things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, someone may say, but I know this person to be a true believer, and he carries on with that relationship with that married woman or that married woman with that married man or whatever. And yet, when they get finished committing adultery, whatever, they repent and they say, "Uh, Lord, forgive us for the, but I'll meet you next Tuesday. Now, isn't that a practice? Isn't that a lifestyle? You're not trying to resist that sin. You're you're just thinking it's a magic formula to, let's say, for example, cheat together and then say, uh, let's pray that we both be forgiven. I'll see you next Tuesday, same time, same motel. Don't tell my wife. Don't tell my husband. That's not someone who's uh, touched by the Spirit. This is someone who's practicing, as the Bible says here in verse 21. Those who practice such things do not inherit the kingdom of God. So all that that, that list we just named, which is not exhaustive, but it is, which means it doesn't tell you every single sin, but that's why he says, and the like. People that do things like this and do it with impunity, that practice this, it's their lifestyle. He's saying, clearly, you're not of God. But here is what, when you list, when you submit yourself to the Spirit of God, here is what the Spirit produces, but the product or the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and, su- and against such there is no law. He just made it very clear. Listen to this. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions, meaning you have put the, the, the fleshy, the human, the unregenerate part of you, you've put that under control. And even when you do sin, you repent and you're sorry and you uh, do not plan to do it again. And if and when you do slip, you repent sincerely and you come before the throne of grace and receive mercy and God forgives you. But it is not your practice. It's not your way. You haven't surrendered your members, that human being that you are. You haven't surrendered that to sin. You haven't surrendered that to uh, lasciviousness, but you've surrendered it to God for his use, which the scripture tells us, and I'll get to that in a minute, that we should do. But the way to walk in the Spirit, the way to surrender yourself to the Spirit of God is also simply put in Ephesians. Saints, and come with me to Ephesians. You know it. Some of you can probably say it by heart. Finally, brethren, Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. See, you can't resist sin without the Lord's strength. We are to uh, come to a place where we say, Lord, you take it. Why? Because I'm giving myself to you. I'm surrendering myself to you for your use. Because I can't resist sin on my own because it's in me. 
It's in my nature, as we read in uh, Romans 5th chapter, 15 through 25. It's part of your nature. But I have the Holy Ghost in me. Yes, but you don't always surrender to it. So here's how you surrender to it. The power of his might. You put on the whole armor of God and you keep it on. You put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But what are the wiles of the devil? Of the devil? Temptation. He tempts you. We're going to get to it in a minute. The devil can't read your mind. He can read your pattern of life and see what you like and then put those temptations in front of you. But we'll show you scripture in a minute. The devil cannot read your mind. It tells us who can, the only one that can read our minds. Listen, for we do not wrestle against uh, flesh and blood, meaning those influences that are luring you away. That's why you need the whole armor of God to resist and fight Satan. You're not just fighting against flesh and blood, but you're fighting against principalities and powers in high places, the rulers of darkness of this age, whose spiritual hosts of, of wickedness is in the heavenly places. He's talking about Satan and his minions, his servers, his, uh, those who serve him, his uh, 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 lesser devils, otherwise known as demons. I want you to see this, saints, because the way to resist or the way to fight the devil is to be strong in the Lord and then let him and his power and his might do the fighting. How? By putting on that which he's given you, his, the armor that God, the whole armor of God. That's how you resist the devil. And that's how you resist uh, the influence to sin, the, the need, the want to sin. And why do I say the need or the want to sin? Because it's in you. It's your nature. It's your fallen nature. We're going to go over a scripture which shows you that sin entered the world through man, not through Satan. Satan can only tempt you. He can't make you do anything. If you don't accept this principle, you're not accepting what the Word of God is trying to teach us. And then you keep scapegoating the, the devil. Let me tell you something, give you a quick example. A failure to recognize the flesh in its disguise can often look like religious zeal. Someone might say, why did Jesus stop Peter? Peter was trying to do a good thing. He was trying to save Jesus from being arrested. And yet, what did Jesus do? He corrected Peter and told him, I have to do what my father said. Are you now fighting against the will of God? Let me tell you something, it's what I mean, saints. Religious zeal is often used by human beings to think that they are so right that you're gonna fight God's battles for him and do what God doesn't want done. Peter was wrong to take out his sword, because Jesus told him, put it back in, he said, sheath your sword. He said, and, and he healed Malchus's ear. But in Peter's mind, because I'm telling you, saints, a failure to recognize what the flesh can do in, in terms of influencing you can make you think it's good religious zeal. Anyone would have said, go ahead, Peter, you stood up to defend Jesus. What you're doing is fighting against Jesus' own purpose. Jesus could have escaped if he wanted to. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, I am he, let them go. Jesus could have, when they were coming, Jesus could say, I know they're coming, let's get out of here. But Peter, and I'm, why do I say this, religious zeal, this, the, a disguise of re religious zeal? Because a lot of saints do that today. You are overly critical of other people, and you may be turning them away from Christ, and you may see it as religious zeal. She just won't get right. And yet you are right, right? And yet the Bible tells you to convert someone that has gone astray. And it says, be careful how you do it, lest you be drawn in. And how might you be drawn in? By a sense of self-righteousness. That's why we are to be patient when someone falls away and are trying to be right, are trying to do the right thing. Who are you to judge another man's servant? And when he says man, he means, who are you to judge God's servant? Just like when he refers to Satan as a man, no man can snatch you out of my grasp. grasp. He's talking about Satan, you mean, meaning no living, no being can grab you, snatch you out of my hand or the Father's hands. So when he says, who are you that judges another man's servant? He's saying, who are you to judge another person? That person is subservient to God. We have one God. So when we are to, trying to bring someone back from an error, from a sin, trying to restore someone, watch how you do that. Watch how you just, that's right, she's no good. Watch all that, watch it. Do it gently, lest you be drawn into sin. And that sin being self-righteousness. And you can often 
think that is really religious zeal because I just want to do the right thing. But what you're doing is fighting against God's purpose in restoring that person, perhaps, as, as, as I use as an example, Peter's apparent religious zeal, which was really the flesh. Peter was responding to what he thought was religious zeal, but really it's what that impetuous, though well-intentioned, Peter wanted to do. If, if you say that is wrong, then why did Jesus correct him if Peter was right? Why did Jesus put the man's ear back on? Why did Jesus tell Peter to put away his sword? Do you not want me to drink the cup that the Father has for me? Do you not want me to do the Father's will? So when you think you're helping God, sometimes you can be working against God and his purpose. All of that is to say that many Christians fail to recognize that the most common cause of, of, of spiritual weakness is your flesh giving in to itself rather than surrendering to the leading of the Spirit while we're told to walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit of God. Because the scripture makes it very plain that Satan can't do anything unless God allows him to. And we'll get to that in a minute. But I wanted you to take this uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. We read it all that on your own. And he tells you what to put on the breath. We've been through that before. But my point is that's the way to fight sinning. You have to be armed with God's protection. Put on the whole armor of God. That's the only way that we're going to uh, not sin. And then even having that on, and I would venture to say, good majority of us have on the armor of God. We don't always surrender to the Spirit of God. We don't always surrender to the leading of God. And thus, as James tells us, we are drawn away by our own desires. James 1.14, and we sin. Now, I want to move to a few scriptures that will make it abundantly clear that Satan cannot make you do anything. And I call this particular section, What Satan Can't Do. And I'm going to give you about 10 or, I don't know, 11 or so scriptures, but I want you to just see it. Some may be repeated and some are very closely related. But I want to make it abundantly clear before we uh, leave this service today and as we launch into this new year. Stop falsely blaming the devil for the sins that the flesh is inviting into your life. Your flesh is inviting that sin in. Yes, Satan tempts us. And yes, the Lord allows him to test us. But no one, as James said, makes you, draws you away except by your own desires. Testing is there before all of us all the time. But God gives us a choice. You can either choose to do things his way, which as you've heard me say for many years, which is usually what you are not inclined to do. When it comes to something, a choice between this and that, usually what seems uncomfortable, usually, what seems un uncomfortable to you, the flesh, usually that's the right thing to do, usually. I'm not saying always, I said usually. Because the flesh likes to please itself. And we are fleshy. Now we have the Holy Ghost we have in us, yes, we have the deposit, but how many of us yield to the leading of it? I don't care how old you are, how long you've been acquainted with the Lord Jesus, how much knowledge of the word, in fact, more and more knowledge you have of the word, more and more we yield to the word. Not that misconstrued, self-imposed knowledge that may have been passed down that's not biblically accurate, like say, sayings like, the devil made me do it. The devil doesn't make you do anything. Nor is the devil as powerful as people think. Yes, he is powerful in, in, in certain senses, but he, and he is to be respected only in the sense, like Michael did, he didn't even bring a railing accusation against him. He said, the Lord will deal with you. The Lord rebuke you. When Michael and Satan were arguing over the body of Moses. But to show you that the, the kind of respect that Satan does merit, does get, he deserves it because he is a, a spirit. He's a powerful one. He's an evil one. But, but he is not all that people think he is. First of all, he is not God. And he can't make you do what you don't want to do. He can't do anything he wants. Some people think Satan can do anything he wants. He's not God. Only God can do anything he wants. Satan cannot. Satan is under the control of God's restraints. Look at Job 1, uh, 7. And let me try to get that for you quickly. You all know the story. Uh, 
here we are, Job. And what are we addressing here? Job, uh, uh, Satan cannot do anything he wants. Listen to this, 1-7. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth in it, uh, on it. Uh, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There are none like him in the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered God and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his house? By the way, saints, this is the first time where Satan tried to prove that uh, eternal security is a lie. God has already said that Job shall not uh, uh, desert him or, or curse him to his face. Satan is saying he only is blessing you. He's only loyal to you because you've given him a lot. Take those things from him and he will curse you to your face. Now, if Satan can do anything he wants, why would he need God's permission to attack Job? That's a principle right here that shows you he cannot do anything he wants. Listen, let me read on. Does he not, uh, uh, does Job fear God for nothing? Meaning only because you bless him with a lot of toys and gifts and what if you will. Have you not made a hedge around him and his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the works of his hands, and his uh, possessions have increased in the land. But now, listen to, listen to this verbiage too. Listen to this wording. Listen to what Satan says. Satan acknowledges that he can't do anything unless God wants it. He says, but now stretch out your hand and touch him and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Did you notice that Satan acknowledged he needed God's power to touch Job? Notice Satan told God, then you stretch out your hand and take from him. Let, let me get to some of his stuff. But he says God had to do it. Satan even acknowledged that. And God says, all right, I'll use you. Satan, uh, God says to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. I want you to see how subtle that was. That Satan said, stretch out your hand and touch what he has. In, in other words, disrupt his beautiful life. And Satan, and then God says, all right, I'm allowing you to go do it. Satan acknowledged that he can't do whatever he wants. But Satan told, asked God, stretch out your hand, acknowledging that it's God's power is over Satan. So please don't give Satan more power than he is due. He cannot do whatever he wants. He can only attack God's children when he has God's permission. Remember that too. This is another reason to be thankful for the year 2020. Whatever's happened to you, those of you that, have, that contracted COVID, those of you that have gone through employment issues, housing issues, uh, food issues, nothing is allowed to come upon you unless God has allowed it. Remember that. There's only one who's in absolute control, and it's all for a reason. Let me not go over that again, either to glorify him, either for his own purposes, either the spiritual war. There's some reason he's allowing it. We have to remember how to look at this thing. Satan's not in control. God's in control. If God is in control, let me ask you this, saints. If God is in control, why does a saint, why does a member of, a, of his family ever complain about anything? Satan's not running this show. God is. He can't do whatever he wants. He told God, stretch out your hand and touch what he has. And God says, all right, you can do this to him, but you can't do this to him. So even Satan acknowledged, and also in Job 2, 4 through 6, you can read. Now let's get to the second thing Satan can do. He, like other fallen angels, can't repent. You have to remember that. Satan cannot repent. Why? Well, John tells us why he can't repent. First of all, in order for someone to repent, you have to have the truth. And if the truth is not in you, how can you repent? Listen to this. This is John 8:44. You are of, this is Jesus talking, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does uh, not stand, uh, does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. If there's no truth in him, how can he ever know the truth? We'll get to this one in a minute, but Satan, saints, understand this. Satan knows everything that's in the Bible. Then why? Can't he avoid his own destruction? There's no truth in him. He doesn't believe what's in the Bible. 
Satan knows every word that's in the Bible. He just can't, he doesn't believe it. He's incapable of repenting because there's no truth in him. When he's uh, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, from what's in him. For he was a liar, he, he, for he is a liar and the father of it. He's the father of all lies. This is what Jesus said, because I tell you the truth, uh, and you do not believe me, Jesus goes on to tell those other uh, uh, hypocrites. But his point is, how can Satan or the fallen angels ever repent when there's no truth in them? In order for you to repent, the truth has to hit you. That's the only way a true believer can come to God. You're not acquainted with the truth and there's no truth in you if you're not saved. The only way you can ever be saved or come to repentance is to have some truth. Satan doesn't. Again, he knows everything that's in the Bible. He doesn't believe his own destruction that's predicted because he doesn't believe the truth. There's no truth in him as it was with those hypocrites. Jesus told them, you're like your father, the devil. There's no truth in you and no truth in him. And that's why Satan nor his fallen angels can be saved. And you also look at 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude 1, 6. There's no truth in him. None. He's unredeemable. The third thing, Satan, and I just alluded to this, Satan can't understand the Bible. Why? Let's go to 1 Corinthians. And under, when I say the Bible, the word of God, period. He can't understand it. Does he know what's in it? Yes, he knows what's in it. <laughs> Satan is one of the most powerful angels there are. But he cannot accept what's in the Bible because he is, uh, there's no truth in him. But listen to this, Satan, don't forget, Satan is the spirit of the world. That is Satan. And he can't explain the Bible, nor can he explain anything of the word of God. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, 9. And please pay attention to this, saints. I'm going to read all of it, but I'll show you the point I want to emphasize. I'm going to read 9 through 11. Eye has not seen, nor, uh, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Only we can understand the things of God. He's revealed them to us, those who believe through his spirit, Paul is saying. For the spirit teaches, uh, searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The deep things of God. Satan can't get it. For what man, know, now he, he gives an example here, what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of that man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Meaning, Satan nor his minions nor his demons can possibly explain or understand the Bible because the spirit of God is not in them. And that's why you say you should never expect people of the world that refuse to accept Christianity, the testimony of the cross, the truth about Christ, be, God being incarnate in Christ. Don't ever expect the world that is under the influence of the God of this world to ever accept that. They're going to always say it's ridiculous. They'll never be able to explain or understand the Bible, and Satan can't even, either, even though he knows everything that's in the Bible. The fourth thing, he can't be in more than one place at a time. Didn't God say, where have you been? He says, I was in the earth walking here and there and here and there. Satan can only be in one place at a time. Listen to this, saints. Why then is there evil and Satan's influence all over the world? Because his demons, that one third of the heavenly host that left God, his minions, Satan's minions, they are doing his bidding all over the place. But Satan himself, he's not God. He's not omnipresent. God is the great omnipresence. He can be any and everywhere all the time, not Satan. And while Satan is a powerful spirit, he can't, he's a created being just like the rest of us. He can't match up with God in any way. And when God asked him where, uh, look at Job 1, 7 again, where have you been? He said, I was in the earth, what? Going here and there. He didn't say I was in the earth being everywhere at one time. Satan is not omnipresent. He is not this uh, uh, great one God that we know of, nor is he anything near God. And as another scripture tells him, remember, Satan, you were created. Satan was one of God's creatures, as we are one of God's creatures, only meaning something created. Satan is not from everlasting to everlasting. God is from everlasting to everlasting. At a certain time, Satan was made, created. So let's stop giving Satan uh, more adulation than he needs. And also stop giving uh, him, uh, ascribing more to him than he actually does. He doesn't make you sin. The scripture tells us you let you sin when you give in to his luring, his tempting. Satan is not as powerful as God. 
And uh, uh, the fifth thing that we want to get to that Satan can't do, he can't control you against your will if you are a Christian. Go to now 1 John. I want you to please pay attention to this wording. He can't control you against your wishes, against your will. 1 John, uh, give me a minute to get there, saints. 1 John 5, 18. 1 John 5, 18. Listen to this. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Now, what does John mean there? Does not sin habitually. Does not sin with impunity. Does not practice as a way of life regular sin. Those that are born of God, born from above, born again, regenerated, same thing. Do not sin perpetually or as a way of lifestyle practice. But he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Meaning does not touch him to control him. Satan cannot control you against your will. Now listen to this. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We're not the world. The world lies under the sway of the wicked one, of, of the devil, not those of us who are born of God. So Satan can't make you sin. You're drawn away, James tells us, by your own desires and enticed. That's what makes you sin. That flesh in you that wants to have its own way, as Paul tells us in Romans 5, 15 through 25. So when I want to listen to that spirit of God that's in me and I, I don't and I say, hold on, spirit of God, let me do what the flesh wants to do. Paul says, see, that's because that's that sin in me. But stop ascribing that power to Satan. Satan cannot have God's children. It's only when we, God's children, give in to Satan and say, come on, Satan, I'll follow you. Because the flesh likes what you're, what you're luring me with. And God is saying, where's that armor I told you to keep on? Put on that armor and I'll help you to resist and fight those fiery darts, the wiles of the devil. You can't on your own. But the power of the might of Jesus Christ can help us to walk right and to walk led by the Spirit of God. The sixth thing I want to draw out here, he can't, as I've been saying, he can't make you sin. The final decision is yours. Now, this is clear that Satan, Satan uh, influenced Adam and Eve, didn't he? Yes, he did. But I want you to read this with me so we do not get any misunderstanding about who brought sin in this world. I tell you, it was not Satan that brought sin in this world. Why do I say that? Because Paul said it, which means Jesus said it. Here it is, Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man, Sin entered the world. How did sin come into this world? Through Adam. I want you to see that. The Bible says it, not I. The Bible says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. But let's just go back to that first phraseology. Sin entered this world through one man. Yes, Satan tempted Adam and Eve. Someone will say, well, Eve did it first. Why are you saying Adam and Eve? Where did Eve come from? Adam's flesh. There we are, back to the flesh. That human, there's something in the human being that when it makes its own choices, not walking in alignment with God, it always wants to please itself. And for some reason, that's why Adam is considered the one who brought sin in. You notice it didn't say sin entered through one woman. Sin entered through one man. And that man was Adam. Just as sin is taken away by one man, the other Adam, Jesus. As we were imputed to sin, we were imputed to righteousness through Jesus Christ. But let us stop ascribing falsely to Satan what the Bible clearly says is our own doing. Now, when I say our own doing, it's through our own uh, surrendering to the flesh. Now, uh, the seventh thing I want to bring out is that Satan can't defeat anyone that is resting in God's power. And for that, you'll look at Jude 8 and 9. But let me just go straight to James 4, 7, which to me makes it abundantly clear that he can't, if you're re relying on God, he can't. Listen to this, uh, James 4, 7. Submit to God. 
Therefore, submit to God. That's, a, that's the first thing. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Satan cannot continually attack. Here's where the seventh and eighth reasons are, are linked together. He cannot defeat anyone resist, uh, resting in God's power, James 4, 7. You also look at Ephesians, put on the whole armor, 6, 10. Also Jude 8 and 9. But I want you to just pay attention to this. James 4, 7, he cannot continually attack a Christian. Not if you're resisting him. The Bible says it. If you resist him, he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. So, when someone says that devil is bothering me every day, every day, listen, the Bible makes it clear that if you constantly, I didn't say haphazardly, I didn't say sometimes, if you constantly resist the devil, the devil gives up. It says it here. I didn't make this up. Resist the devil and he will not, it's not just walk from you slowly. He will flee from you. He will see, I can't get this one. This one loves Jesus too much. I can't get her. I can't get him. This is not hyperbolic language. I'm not speaking something that isn't true or doable. The Bible makes it clear. If you surrender to the leading of the Spirit of God, draw nigh to God, surrender to his leading. If you resist that devil over and over because he's going to tempt you, he never makes you do anything. But he will tempt you. And he'll try once, he'll try twice, he may try a few times. But the Bible makes it very clear in James 4, 7, that if you resist the devil, he will not just leave you. Flee implies run from you quickly in disgust. He will run from you in defeat saying, I can't get that one. And know what he'll do? Try for an easier target. Have you ever seen a, a, a pack of lions going after a herd of anything? Do they always choose the strongest bull first? No. They'll look for that one that's limping or they'll look for the weakling. They'll look for the easiest prey. But once that prey shows that it cannot be taken or it's going to keep up with the herd and stay away, he goes after something else or gives up his hunt. And doesn't the Bible say that Satan is like a, a crouched lion, a, a, a lion I should say, roaming around seem, seeking whom he may devour? When he knows he can't devour you, you resist him, you stay where you're supposed to stay, in the, in the analogy of the, uh, the herd, stay within the protection of the herd, where well, you stay within God's protection. Resist him. Put on that whole armor that Ephesians 6 tells us about. And keep it on constantly. And then surrender to God. Submit yourself to God. Draw nigh to him. Satan will see Job too well protected. Another thing Satan can't do, uh, Hebrews. He, Satan can't predict the future, to use Job again. But let me use Hebrews also. Satan cannot predict the future. Uh, did he predict what was going to happen with Job? Wasn't he wrong? He said, do this and do that, and he'll curse you to your face. Was he right? Satan was not right. He can't predict the future. Uh, we're Hebrews 4.12. Look at this, saints. And before I read, the, let me say, he can't predict the future or read people's minds. I want to throw that in there, too. He cannot read your mind. Don't think Satan can read your mind. He can only read your activities and your actions and then see what you like and don't like and then try to attack you on that basis. But there's only one that can read your mind, and the Scripture puts it this way. For the word of God is living, quick, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and it and, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Did it say Satan was, or did it say the word of God? God is the one that knows your thoughts. God is the one that discerns what's in your heart. Now, to show you that Satan can't predict the future, he was wrong when he said Job would do this and do that. Did he do it? No, he did not. And had he known the future, would he not have tried something else? Satan does not know the future. God knows the future. Now, Satan knows as much about the future as we do. Because what has been written in the Word, God tells us what's going to happen. The sad thing for Satan is he doesn't believe it. We do. Listen to this as we um, join to a conclusion now. Uh, uh, Satan cannot take away your salvation. How do I know that? John 10, 27 and through 30. You read it on your own. Is anyone, and I, again, I alluded to it earlier, the word man is in there, but it means any being. Is anyone able to snatch you out of God or the Father's hand? First of all, who's more powerful than God? Who's more powerful than Jesus, God? 
Who, no one. So when he says, you're not able to snatch him out of my hand, what he's saying is, Satan can't take your salvation from you, nor any other being. The Lord is saying, I'm the one that's holding you, and the Father is holding you, and no one can snatch you out of, the, out of my hands or out of the Father's hand. You read John 10, 27 through 30. And here's what shows you that Satan knows only the future that we know and still doesn't believe it. Because the last thing that Satan can't do is win. If Satan was so powerful or, or more powerful than God, he's very powerful, but he's not more powerful than God. Why wouldn't he be able to read this scripture and see what's going to happen to him and avoid it and come back and repent? He can't. There's no truth in him. And those who don't come to the Lord, there's no truth in them. But Revelation, clearly, as we conclude now, Revelation, and please read this with me because this is so abundantly clear that a child could understand this. Let's go to the 20th chapter of Revelation. If you would know this and not change your ways, that goes to show you Satan doesn't believe the word of God. You see, you got to watch out for people who think they're always the brightest one in the room. They, they're the, the know-it-alls. I don't want to call any names because they don't want to dishonor anyone. But when people think they're the brightest, they end up like this. You can see what's been predicted, and still he doesn't believe it. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. He can't win. That's the last thing we want to say for this sermon today. Satan can't win. Also, he can't repent. If he could, if he could accept the truth, if he could believe the truth, he would have seen what's in Scripture and repented. He and his minions, the fallen angels, the Bible says there's a place reserved for them. And they are going to their own estate, you read Jude, a place reserved for those fallen angels, a place reserved for Satan. But to show you that he is not, as the young people say, all that, he can read right here what's going to happen to him, but you know what Satan says? Phooey, that's not going to happen to me. I don't believe it. He shuns the word of God. I said all that to say Satan can't make you do anything. He can only tempt you and then you give him permission to use you. But that's why we're taught to surrender our members to God and let God be the one that influences us. Let God be the one that directs our paths. Do not give up uh, all of this uh, uh, supposed power to Satan thinking you have no hope, no way out because I'm just so weak. Yeah, you're weak, but let the weak say I am strong. How? By drawing close to God and God will draw close to you. By not surrendering to the whims and the desires of your human nature, but surrender to uh, God and let him use your members, your whole being. Let him use your members that you may be glory, a, a glory and an honor to him for his service, not Satan. Don't fear Satan. Fear the one that can destroy you both spiritually and naturally, and that is God Almighty. But thanks be to God that the wretched human beings that we are, we have a way out. And let us all together, to, from this moment on and moving into this new year, thank our Father in heaven for the advent and the birth of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we have a way out because without you, there is no other way. But I know one thing I've learned. I do not have to sin, and Satan can't make me do anything I don't want to do. Let us rely on the power of God and be saved and be blessed. God bless you one and all in this new year. Continue to pray for one another, look out for one another, and love one another. Peace be unto you, saints. God bless you all.